Hi everyone. So today we're going to have lesson time. We're going to learn a little bit about objective personality, the system designed by Dave Superpowers with his wife, Shannon. And here to tell us about it is Joseph Ross. He's going to tell us about <laughs> OP, share some of his wisdom and knowledge about this very different uh, typology system. So, Joseph, when you're when you're first learning OP, mm -hmm. what are some of the things you have to keep in mind? Uh, so the number one rules that Dave and Shannon actually teach is that number one, everyone can do everything, and everybody has everything. So when you're looking to type yourself objectively, you technically can't because to be objective it means to get some outside triangulation, and um, you also need to be open to the information and not try to box yourself in right away because the more that you actually box yourself in, the harder it'll be for you to devalue whatever it is you're trying to box yourself into. So I feel like people who have some sort of value attached to a certain type or function or whatever, what they're gonna do uh, that's gonna trip them up is they're going to almost kind of mold themselves to a certain type or, or what have you. And then as a result of that, it might be harder for them to see themselves as anything other than the type that Dave and Shannon, let's say if they were to type them, um, would give them. And that can also mm -hmm. cause a little bit of stress in someone's life. And that can make it a little bit harder to actually learn the system because you went in valuing something without actually keeping your mind open. Um, I also find that over-researching information, uh, over-researching the system will be more of a uh, shoot yourself in the foot kind of thing because of the fact that um, the more information you have, the more you're unconsciously down downloading the information and trying to carry out whatever it is that you, um, whatever it is that you're trying to present to the world. But I have noticed that as time went on, people are seemingly becoming a little bit more um, open to the information and going in with the knowledge that you might not actually be what you think you are. And when I entered into the community first, it was harder for me to actually take that uh take that into consideration I, I i went in i just looked at the information like relatively quickly and then it was like oh time to get typed and i wish that i took a little bit more time to really process it and really just kind of um be a little bit more respectful of what it is that i was actually trying to learn so that's something that i would say keep in mind is be open and also expect you know expect uh any, any type of surprise hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. So you said triangulation. Mm -hmm. Now, what is meant by triangulation in this context? So with triangulation, essentially what it means is basically um, having an outside observer um, and also having another, so having like, let's just say, at least two people to be able to form some sort of, okay, me relative to that person, how is it that I am relating to that person? not relating to that person, but how am, I, how am I like that person? How am I not like that person? Because I think I'm doing something one way, but that person, and that person, let's just say is a type, let's just say like they know their type, but in relation to me and that person, I'm different because I, I'm, my actions carry out or the way that my, um, the way that my life carries out is different in the sense of the choices I make and the observations I make uh, in relation to that person. So let's just say if I'm like, let's say a single decider or a single observer, um, am I having more issues with people or things, observations? Am I missing something or am I having a hard time accepting um, my place amongst other people or am I having a hard time um, having other people accept me in the grander scheme of things? So it's a little bit like you're trying to kind of remove yourself from you, what you think you are and see yourself more outward uh, according to what, who you are in relation to other people on a spectrum. That's basically what they're, that they teach us in the class. Everything, all this is on a spectrum. So we have to see, we have to triangulate according to the spectrum. Okay. So it's interesting that you mentioned the idea of being an observer versus decider. And I know that yes. this is perhaps the most important of the coins, as it were. But mm -hmm. so what do you say are the main, why is observer and decider this main coin, this first thing? which uh, Dave and Chan will be looking at for typing people? Well, 
if I if I might just um, actually say the most important thing that Damon Shannon actually say um, is the human needs, and that is tied to whether or not you're an observer or decider. So it is tied to um, what your life issues are. So, for example, someone who's let's say a single observer would be in their system in, in, in the objective personality system, an EP or an IJ as a single observer, and then there's the EJ and the IP for a single decider. So the reason why this is so important, at least what from what I understand it is because of the fact that um, when you're trying to type somebody, you have to keep in mind, what is the conversation about? What are they actually talking about? Are they really freaking out about things? I mean, everyone, like, like they say, everyone does everything. Everyone has everything. So what is it that their life is revolving around in terms of their biggest issues and struggles? So when it comes to things, observations, the government, or some sort of, I don't know, um, <laughs> like a school system or just like, you know, whatever, the car. Is that really the biggest thing that they're going to freak out about where their energy is just going to, like their whole entire world is going to be shaken up where they're just like snapped out of consciousness and they're just like, oh my God, this is the most freakishly like real thing that I can't even just deal with it. Or is it more on the side of the people? How do I relate to that person? Who am I in relation to that person? Who is that person person in relation to me? So it's like, it's a very you, me kind of conversation that deciders have with, um, with people in general. It's like, are you higher than me? Am I higher than you? People who are, let's say the IPs are gonna feel more like they are, they have something to offer the world. They have something that they want to put out there and they want the tribe to get on board with what it is that they're trying to give. And then the EJs are going to be more of like going along with the tribe because they want to find out who they are amongst the tribe members. So it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of um, game, I guess you can say, in terms of the world that they live in, the deciders, where they feel like they need, to, like their biggest freakouts are, I don't know who I am or other people need to know who I am. Mm. So that's the decider thing. Right. So just to summarize that then, at least for the deciders, you've got two main polarities, both around how we relate to society, you could say. Mm -hmm. One sort is what says, I, um, society should follow me because I have all the best ideas. And that would be more the introverted decider, right? Decider mm -hmm. being a bit like a judger. And then yes. the introverted decider would be, I don't know who I am. I don't know what ideas are important. I got to find out who I am and where I belong by going to the tribe and appealing to the tribe. Mm -hmm. And so that that seems to be the idea that one sort of takes a sort of almost a Zarathustra sort of way, like I've got the ideas. I know people should follow me because I've worked it all out. And then yes. the other is sort of the one who doesn't really know where they're coming, doesn't know, really know themselves without going to the mm -hmm. tribe and discovering it through their bonding with other people so that's right. that, that is a very interesting difference there and it's it also is, is unusual as well because it sounds to me as if the introverted decider is actually a, f a lot more firm and knows himself a lot more confidently whereas the the, um, the extra decider seems to be almost a sort of weak almost more um i don't know needing other people to tell them what to think sort of person right you would think that though yeah. you would think that it, to the outside world, yes, that's what it appears. Uh, but the right. thing is, is that the introvert decider, they may think that, you know, they're above people, but when they actually go out to the tribe, they will get a huge dose of reality and saying, who the hell are you? We don't really relate to you. We don't care about whatever it is that you're caring about. Go away. You're weird. You're dumb, whatever. And then it's a real big hit for the introvert decider who, like the IP, but for the EJ, Believe it or not, they actually don't think that they are confident and they can appear as really, really weak. And the reason for this is because the the extrovert decider is constantly going to the tribe and asking them for their opinion. So they're trying to get that ping back. They're trying to see how is the tribe responding to what it is that I'm either valuing or what it is that, that I'm thinking. And they want to seek out different tribe members to actually get the best value wow. or the best idea or the best reasons so it, it, it can they can appear as weak but really what they don't realize is that they're actually very internally strong they don't realize wow. just how much worth they actually have and so their whole life discovery is figuring out what is their worth 
And so that's why you would think that the IPs are very confident. To them, they're very confident in certain respects. But you know, when they go actually go out there, it's more of like, yeah, let's just see how confident you are. We're going to knock you over and tell you that, you know, you're actually worth nothing. Go away. And it's going to be a really big hit to them because the tribe is not accepting them. That's their biggest fear. And with the EJs, it's the opposite. They actually probably do have a lot of worth. They probably do have a lot to offer to people, but they're not thinking that or feeling like they are. And so they just constantly put themselves down and, and say that they're not enough, not enough, not enough, because they see everybody on a spectrum. They're very aware of the outer world. So they feel like they're not giving enough and they're not doing enough. And that really just feels almost traumatizing to them because they're just like, well, then I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth enough. That's interesting. Like, I know that going back to sort of, I know, myers briggs stereotype land, someone mm -hmm. like Napoleon's often been typed sort of an ENTJ, like typical, that sort of stereotype, big boss mm -hmm. figure. But it sounds to me like he wouldn't be an ENTJ or like an extroverted decider, uh, according <laughs> to this step. Because I can't imagine him sort of going to the tribe saying, I don't know who I am. I need people to tell me whether I'm worthy. He's always sort of person mm -hmm. saying, look, I'm amazing. Follow me. So maybe he might be an IP in uh, an introverted decider in uh, no, in OP. I don't know. Well, you, well, I have to tell you this, though. There are some EJs that can look like IPs. It depends on their animal stack. So if anyone's, that, anyone's looking at um, the, my name... Mm -hmm. And if, am I pointing to it correctly? Like this, like boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. Okay. So if you're looking at this right now, okay. So I'm play, consume, blast, and sleep. Okay. So then that that basically is saying that I have an extroverted animal as my first animal, and then I have my my information animal, which I'll, I'll explain all these parts later. Um, I'm taking in, and so basically. Sleep is a very introverted animal and play is a very extroverted animal. And then consume is the most introverted of the information, blast is the most extroverted. So because I have sleep very low, it's my last animal, I tend to appear a lot more extroverted. I, I kind of have the appearance of an EJ, even though I was typed as an observer in objective personality. But the thing is, is that there are some EJs, right? They are, let's just say, blast high or they're play high. So you can be an EJ in play or blast. Right. Mm -hmm. Blast is the one that you'll see on the Myers Briggs, like you know the T E S I, the F E N I. You'll, the, right. Those are like the standard Myers Briggs types, but they can also have their play animal as last, so it tones down the E J ness of them, and it really just pushes up more of the I P because of the fact that the consume and uh, the consume and sleep have that introvert decider in their animal, and yes. that's what they use to make decisions. So it just almost like activates and enhances the uh, introvert decided a little bit more to make him look more IP like. So I don't know Napoleon. I don't know his story. I don't know what he would say. I, I have no idea who he is um, mm -hmm. personally. So I can't give you an answer. But if let's say he is an ENTJ, uh, he could potentially be a very introverted ENTJ and appear like he is a lot more um, like an IP. Okay. That, that, yeah, that, that, I can see how if you overlay the animals over the human needs, you mm -hmm. can make sense of some very differing and very perhaps odd behaviors, at least from the initial, uh, like one in 16 type. If people right. are typed into one of the 16 and then not acting anything like that type, you can then make sense about using the animals. Mm -hmm. so that's exactly. very interesting. Okay. Yeah. What, one, one thing I'd like to, I, th I think we, we cover deciders very well, but you also didn't cover observers perhaps the same degree. So what would be the, right. main, the main difference between, say, an introverted observer and an extroverted mm -hmm. observer? So with the introverted observer, the main thing that they're looking for is control, certainty, and just having some sort of box, right? So right. let's just say it's an IJ. They want to have some sort of box where everything is, for lack of a better term, in line, scheduled. They have an idea of what it is that's coming up. There's no surprises. They're not looking for surprises. So they actually have, they're able to do things that an EP can do, you know, which they're more of like on the cuff, like, you know, fly by the seat of their pants and are more chaotic. And I'll go into depth of what that means a little bit in a second. But with the IJ is they, in order for them to go into that chaos mode, they need everything to be organized and under control so that they can actually do more of the chaos because they know they're not going to get any surprises. So for example, um, I did like a bit of an introvert observer thing um, before where I was like kind of looking inward and thinking, all right, I'm going to be on this call with you, right? I'm going to tell my parents, if you need me, I'll be done in an hour. 
do not come in and mess with my box right now because I'm going to be doing something very important. It can interrupt my train of thought. So what I need you to do is you just need to respect my time because let's say I didn't do that. Let's say I didn't cover my bases and my mom came upstairs, knocked on the door and she had something and we were in the middle of this. We're live, people are watching. I don't want them knowing about my personal life a little bit. I, my mom doesn't want to be on camera either. So in order to kind of control the situation, control the chaos, I gave them information. I, I relayed the information to them and I said to them, just make sure you don't bother me because I'm doing something very important. Um, I'll let you know when I'm done in an hour. So that's more of like the introvert observer. And that's like, that's basically what it is. Um, and then the extrovert observer, they're looking for more possibilities or like they're looking for new. They want to, they don't want, they don't want things to be controlled. They don't want to have limits to what it is that they're doing. They want to be able to look for new information, like, you know, new sensory, new patterns. They don't want to limit to like the same old patterns um, or, or, or sensory information. They want things to be open. They want to be able to go out. They want to explore. They want more. They want to look up one more article. They want to look at one more book, one more piece of research before they actually narrow down. Sometimes they don't narrow down. If you're an extrovert observer, you're not. it's going to be very hard for you to narrow down to something because of the fact that you have this whole entire world of information. How do we know which information is the right information? We don't know. We need someone else to narrow it down for us. So when, when you have all this information out there, you have to like the, the the thing that like in socionics you have the duels, right? The EP can use an IJ to narrow the information for them, or they have to do the work and put the work into themselves to actually narrow the information themselves, which is very very hard for them. It's very hard for them to narrow in on the information. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So it seems to me therefore that so any sort of SI type, any sort of NI type, and uh, as their main savior, as you'd say. That'd be someone who'd be that sort of needing order, needing things to be planned out, needing things to be more controlled. So every type of sort of more NE or SE or into there, they need actually more novelty, more new experiences, not controlling, letting things come in and can be called, as David called that sort of chaos monkey. Yes, yes. chaos monkey. Where, yes. But one thing that I do want to say is that a lot of people that might be watching this, they might say, well, I'm not like that. I don't do things like that. But the thing is, is that, like I said in the beginning, everybody can do everything. We're all capable of doing everything. But the thing is that we have to keep in mind is what Dave and Shannon are tracking is that relative to a whole spectrum of people that they're tracking when they're typing somebody, you fall more on this side and not so much on this side. So when there are people who might fight their type and they might say, but I don't do that. It's like, well, compared to someone who does do that, that we know that does that or that falls into that on the spectrum they are having a harder time with it than you are and that's just dave and shannon's observations right okay so it's sort of an interesting tension there it's like being told by the by the theory what these main needs are but mm -hmm. you may be less having less trouble with those needs than some other people or less of a focus on those needs but I also wonder if you've, you know, if you're sort of more on one side of the need than on the other side of the need, um, but not far off onto the extreme, and you don't really relate to that main need you're given, how do you navigate that? That you're being told that's your need, but you don't necessarily identify with that need you're we being told you have. Hmm. So that's a good question. It could have a lot to do with your animal order, because there are people who, let's just say, are super, super extroverted IPs. And right. they have double activation. D double activation is essentially um, where the animal order is. So, like when you actually do the math of the animals, it comes. It gives you like this sort of like, like a, um, like a equation, where it tells you that um, let's just say like you're let's just say you're an ISTP, right? Um, and let's just say you're consumed by best sleep, right? Yeah. Uh, ISTP. The person that, that type of ISTP is going to have double activation on their FE. So they may actually feel because they don't have the sleep processing where their introverted decider is being activated to feel like they are not necessarily um, feeling more IP problems or feeling more EJ problems. And they're feeling like they're doing more um, FE than they are TI. And the reason for that is because of that double activation. So depending on where you fall on the spectrum, like if you're like right in the middle, like for example, I want to go to a, I want to go to an IJ because like they're easy to understand in terms of the like the Myers Briggs or sorry the objective personality type of um, um, setup. So 
the IJ that has consume as their last animal, they're the most IJ looking, like the most Myers Briggsy types of types of IJs, because of the fact that they're doubling up on the blast, which is the functions of extrovert decider and introvert observer. So let's just take an INFJ, right? Yeah. They have their NI and FE and they're doubling up on it. So they're gonna feel more closer to what their type is than someone who's, let's say, the ISTP who's all the way cranked up as the um, as having double activation on their on their FE and their SE. They're gonna probably feel more like a an ENFJ or more like a uh, an ESTP than they are gonna feel like right. an ISTP. Right. So so, so I'll, I'll, okay, that's interesting. So right. So going to animals. You could be, so I could, I could be an ENTP, but I could have double activation on my FE and my mm -hmm. SI. Perhaps. And you do. And so you have a, you do have double activation on your FE. Um, yeah, if FE. you were to have it on, yeah, if you were to have it on your SI, hmm. So you would have to be a play first ENTP yeah. to yeah. have that set up because those are what we call glass lizards because glass lizards are things that. They, they describe it as you look like a lizard, but you um, like, or you look like a snake. You're actually a lizard, but you look like a snake because you don't have like the, it's it's basically like the anatomy. So it's like, you're confused mm. at what you're looking at because it's like, am I looking at this or am I looking at that? Am I actually looking at an ENTP or am I looking at an ESFJ? Cause there's FE and NE. So it's just like, there's that, that confusion there, right? Cause there's like right. the double, yeah. Yeah, so it seems to me that David Chan, they have these coins they use that to work mm -hmm. out the type. And so if mm -hmm. you buy these coins, then every single time you will be that type. But you might not actually feel that you think like that type. You may not quite necessarily act like that type. But mm -hmm. and, and the way which they can explain that is because your animals could cause you mm -hmm. to be Dover and can be acting right. like a completely different type, which you say is a glass right. lid. It's confusing. So you're, the, the coins are telling them that you're this type, but none of your behaviors, none of your other independent ways of telling you that you're that type are matching yep. up to that. So they'll say, right. well, it's because of your animals. And the animals are out of whack with how one would normally be in that particular mm -hmm. type. So what, right. what advice would Dave and Shannon give to someone who is a glass lizard? What would they, um, what would they say to someone with a glass in terms of understanding themselves and how to actually make sense of that? It seems to be almost like it's like the levels of easiness for getting this advice for swallowing the pill. That mm. you, it's easy to swallow the pill if everything lines up because the advice they're giving is what would be standard for that particular type. But what if another type in the 512 mm. is one like a glass lizard? How do you get a glass lizard to come to terms with a type and they've been given based on the coins, even if they're very, very different in their behaviors and what they perceive of their thoughts and motivations? Mm -hmm. How do you swallow that pill? Well, I can't really speak for Dave and Shannon, but what I can say is, let's say if I were to um, approach somebody in that situation, I would tell them basically, let's look at your life, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, let's say, are a glass lizard and you are cranked all the way up and you are an ISTP who has TI at the top and FE at the bottom, but the thing is that the, what's, what's different is that you have that, that FE just like you know, double activated, right? Or it's usually more like the bottom function is the glass lizard, the bottom function is double activated. So it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's double activated on like their bottom two. They are technically glass lizards, but it's more of like the bottom function when there's like a lot of activation on it. So the advice that you would technically give is work on that animal that's taking away from the activation on the function that is your savior, right? So if it's mm -hmm. a, an ISTP, it's like, okay, so you, you can say they're sleep last they have sleep at the very the very back like how i do right over here see sleep yeah and work i do on that well. yeah and you do too yeah. work on that animal do some self-processing detach from the outer world and look inward and say to yourself okay what happened where do i want my life to go and how do i want to do it in terms of either building blocks like building the blocks to get there based off of my own logic and how i would do things my way that's ti or FI, which is going to be more like, what is it that I'm valuing? What is it that I really, that, that I like, that I would like to do in terms of my values, my internal values? So it's more, it's more going to be like, um, uh, you have to work on the last animal in order to actually get to what they call the alpha state. And the alpha state is when all four of your functions are working together for a common goal. Hmm. I see. Ah. So when you're in that alpha state, does it mean that your animals change or? No, 
no is it just what sort of this is interesting so you pin down the animals so what exactly is shifting then if you got the animals sorted out what are the things that are shifting and rising and lowering in this sort of growth and development within the 512 well the way that i like to see it is that the animals are attached to, like basically it's like the functions let's just say like they're their own entity right like there's one two three four right the animals are basically from two wires that ping on the function bubbles so let's just say like there's like invisible bubbles over here right there's four so they're pinging in different ways so there's one wire so the last animal that's pretend like it's like i always like to see it as like um the wires are like intensity right so there's a lot of intensity on the wires think of it like a light bulb or like a like you know like you know like those dim lights that you can like adjust and like you know how how bright it goes and how how dim it goes you know what i'm talking about yes i can okay. yes so imagine your consume animal as being like cranked all the way up it's, it's so bright and there's so much light hitting that animal right and then yeah. when you go to play then it's going to be like just a little it's going to be just a little less intense than um then the uh consume animal is basically going to assist in adding more light to the consume the play and then yeah. the blast is going to be just like a little bit you're going to get a little bit of blast you're going to see just a little bit and then sleep is going to be like the most dim it's going to be like you know it's going to be the the least activated there's going to be very little energy going into it so essentially what it is is like when you reach an alpha state you are going to get be able to just like tone down the energy of of the uh the consume play blast for you let's say and it's almost like you're going to equalize it you're going to equalize the energy that's going to consume so that you can blast better you're equalizing the energy that's going to play so you can sleep process so it's like basically creating an equalizer as opposed to one's just super intense and the other ones are just getting less intense and it's just like you know you're not using one as much so the alpha state is basically just balancing out the intensities and bringing down the energy interesting let me just very quickly close the door just because the base hang on a second sure. right so just so people who want to get sort of an idea of how these sorts of things fit together um diagrammatically i've got a quick um image just to show people which i think could be helpful sure so let me just Go to that now. Yes. I'm excited. I didn't know you. Yeah. So here we have. Ah, oh, okay. Actually, actually, let me just um, face it like yes. If you see here, right, mm -hmm. you can see the um. This is meant to be an NIFI, so sort of like an INTJ, you could say, where yes, they're what's known as the jumper, and the jumper right. would be um. If I'm right in saying that's the type where. It's not the the dominant and the auxiliary, which are some of the saviors, the more mm -hmm. uh, the strong, supposedly the, the stronger areas. Rather, mm -hmm. saviors are actually their dominant and their tertiary. So for mm -hmm. this, yes. it would be NI and FI. Right. right. And so, and you can see here, the animals would be these things connecting things up. Blast, sleep, play, and consume. In this example, right, sleep yeah, is a strong blast would be the next strongest then play and finally consume is like the little one which would be put in brackets if even mentioned at all as you can see in uh, joe's type so that's right. um so could you just tell me just a little bit about why they come up with jumpers and also could you tell me just a bit about saviors and demons for people who don't quite know what saviors and demons sure are? sure so can you repeat the first question i didn't hear about jumpers what would you say now yes yeah, so could you tell me a little bit what what why did they come up with this idea of jumpers and okay yeah. and the saviors and demons okay yeah. so the the whole concept of jumpers actually comes from um basically th what they're noticing in people is that there are people who they seem like they're very like let's say an ij they're like a selfish ij so this is right, right now what you're looking at is like a more selfish version of version of an intj where they're not really chasing tribe validation as much as they're focusing in on inward on their own personal values so right. with the intj and ifi they're gonna have a bit more of like an NF flavor. They're gonna feel a little bit more like they are um, trying to figure out the value of something abstractly. And it's gonna be a lot more personal as opposed to someone let's just say who's an NEFP, right? They're gonna be looking for more conceptual extroverted types of values. So it's like 
they want to see what the tribe values with all bunch a whole bunch of different new concepts. Whereas MIF has to be, they're going to find concepts that are more personal because the I, the introvert, is more about what's more personal and subjective to me. And then the FI is going to be the values that are important to me, not to everybody else, FE, but to me. So what you're seeing right here is more of a selfish INTJ, a more IP-like INTJ. But he, but this is Dave's type. This is what Dave yeah. uh, Powers' type is, and he's going to be more. Um, he, but if you if you look, look at where the blue wires are, right? So yeah. imagine, take out the red wires. Just take it out, and what two functions are being surrounded by those blue wires? The NI and the TE. So Dave is going to look a lot more like an INTJ, even though he is NIFI, because mm -hmm. the double activation is happening on both the NI and the TE. So that's what you're looking at right over there. Um, in terms of saviors and demons, because Dave is focusing, or this person, let's just say it's not just Dave, um, this person is focusing more on their internal value system. They're not going to be chasing tribe validation, going and helping the tribe as much. They're gonna they're gonna have more awareness around it. They're gonna feel because it's closer to the top. They're gonna feel a little bit more obligated to go to the tribe, but they're gonna do it in a little bit more of like a I really don't want to, but I know it's something that needs to be done kind of way. So it's going to feel a lot more like a standard INTJ because that consume is last. And he's doubling up on his INTE. But at the end of the day, who is he doing the decision? Like who, who is this person doing um, or making decisions for? It's for the self. So that's where they're finding that the middle two functions, you can either go um, saviors on your first and second or your first and third. Right. Okay. Interesting that. So in a way, you have a bit of both. So even an, an introverted uh, observer, for instance, you know that's going to be about control, right? The introvert observer could also then secondarily be either tribe or self. In the case of um, Dave, it would be self. Um, right. In the case of you, as a extroverted observer, so you'd be about uh, about um, chaos first, but mm -hmm. you'd also have um, yeah, you'd also have tribe as your second, rather than yes. self, which is interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, if you kind of like go scroll over a little bit, I want, to, I want you to look at this other thing too. I want everyone else to yeah. see this as well. Uh, the next one. Yes. Yes. This is, this, this so this is yours, isn't it? Wouldn't it? This is close to mine. I'm activated on my blast. I'm not activated on my sleep. So what right. you're looking at over here is somebody who's going to be searching more for um, new information through gathered through the SE because OE is a gathering function and OI is an organizing function. Mm. So you're seeing right here somebody who is more chaotic, they're more EP, they're more of an EP, but they also have, what's interesting is that they have a little bit more um, need for tribe validation than their uh, standard ESFP counterparts, like the, the SEFIs. Right. But the interesting thing about this one too, is they're doubling up on their top two functions. So they're going to appear more of an, like an ESFP, but the only difference is that what their, their, their secondary human need is not like it's, the gathering is the first one. Gathering of the sensory is the first primary human need. The secondary uh, uh, human need is going to be getting going out and asking the tribe questions, getting information from the tribe through uh, reasoning and and logic, because they themselves don't know what is it that I actually value. I need to see what are the ideas that everyone else is putting out, so then I can find out what it is that I value. They want to see the spectrum of the reasons and the ideas of what the tri what the other tribe is doing. So let's just say like. You know, people are finding things that, um, like, you know, they're in a group of people, right? And um, they're finding that this way of working out works best. And they're kind of going to that person. And they're like, oh, this really does really work, whatever. And then some, let's say another trainer, a personal trainer comes into the gym is like, I have the best way. And they're just like, all right, well, I don't know if I like this idea. Maybe I might like that idea. So they're kind of like gathering ideas. It's like, think of the extroverted ones as like gathering, right? Even though SE is gathering information. TE is going to be, be, be gathering ideas and reasons so they can actually figure out whether or not they value it or not because they are just chasing after the tribe. And they also want tribe validation to fit in. And they want to know um, if the tribe thinks that they're smart because they're following along with the ideas or if they're like, you know, if they're valuable because they're following along with the ideas. So they're trying to figure out what is it that they value with the TE. Whereas the NIF by guy, what they're doing is they're trying to figure out where do I want my future to go based off of something that I value? Do I really value this job? Do I value this relationship? Do I value, do I value this thing? And if I do, if the answer is yes, where is my future going to go? Where am I planning abstractly to go in this relationship, in this job? 
if I'm not valuing it, then where else, like, where else can I go that I would value it? And the decision is always going to uh, go back to the introvert decider on the NIFI, NIFI side. And the SETE side is going to be, what is the tribe saying I should do? And even though I might not value it, what are they saying is the best idea of where I should go based on the reasoning of the tribe? And they want to keep on gathering in more information about all those different ideas. Okay, interesting. So why is it known as a spectrum of reasons or a spectrum of values? So spectrum is more going to be like, it's going to be, spectrum is implying extroverted. It's yeah. like the extroverted spectrum, the external, the external world. It's more about, it's more about breadth. Right, you know, going like skipping above and just going like you know from the next to the next to the next to the next, not really deep, diving deep down. They're not really getting like a deeper understanding of their values or their ideas. They're just going across and they're trying to see what is it that this person's um, reasoning is, or what is their what are their values? This person, this person, that person, this person. It's kind of like skipping a rock. Whereas the DI function is more of like okay, so that the rock skips, but where does it drop, and where is that rock settling? So it's, it's more of like, you know, basically, where is it going down deep and, um, and, and, and collecting based off of like what it values or what it thinks in terms of reasoning. Thank you. Um, OK, so also we know what, that these two are jumpers. What would you call someone like me who isn't a jumper? You would just be a standard, more on the extroverted side, ENTP, because your functions are going to be uh, your state functions are going to be your any <clears throat> and your ti, and that's because you have consume as your first animal. So yeah. that's going to be you're going to be like more of a standard, but more of like the like an ej ish kind of entp because you have that double activation on your fe. So imagine the sete right here. Imagine it was any ti fe uh, and si. You would be consume play blessed, and the red wire would be blue, and the sleep wire would be uh, red and dotted. And um, and so you would have that double activation on that third function. Right, I see. So in mm. still someone who is yeah um, chaos and self rather than tribe, mm. but sort of give the impression perhaps a little bit more than average. They're more in touch with with other people and teaching to other people. Is that right? Uh, can you reword that? Because I'm not really sure if I. Um, so, so, so conventional sort of NETI where I'm primarily about chaos and then about self, so not not about tribe, but right. I also come across as more of a teacher to others, maybe in terms of blasting. Is is that is that what right. you mean? A bit more effy ish. Yeah, because or... the yeah because the thing is is that you have that play, so you, you the savior play, so the savior play. You're going to want to interact with the tribe. You're going to want to provide value for the tribe. Yeah. You're going to want to give back to the tribe. And then with the blast, even though it's your third animal, it's more like a hobby. They, they always consider yeah. the third animal like a hobby animal. So it's something that you do, but it's something that you do second to your consume. If you were given the choice, you know, you know, A or B, consume or blast, you would probably want to pick the consume first. If I was saying I have new information here about Socianus, you know, would you rather learn about this new information or teach the same old information that you've been teaching. Yeah. And let's say this is revolutionary, but you know, this is also more valuable. You should like, would you want to do this? And your decision would be like, well, you know, my, my urge, my desire, my want, my, my need, my human need is I want to go and consume that new piece of information. I can go and blast the information, no problem, but mm -hmm. I really, really want to actually learn what it is that's new out there that Socianus has discovered. It's an addiction almost. Okay. Thank you. So I think we've now we now covered um, at least the, the framing of the types based on the human needs. We've covered the the jumpers. We covered the animals. So how about the modalities? I think it's the, the, the one thing remaining. Could you explain a bit more about modalities? Some people are confused about my modalities. I could see in some of the comments earlier. Uh, yes. I think it's the, the wrong way around for me actually. So could you explain modalities to people? That'd be, that'd be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This one is actually a lot of fun because it's, this is like a more like a newer type of thing that they've discovered. So the modalities are actually tied to, if you look at the first letter um, of, of you and I, they're tied to the first letter is going to be your sensory, whether it's SE or SI, it doesn't matter. Savior demon does not matter. And then the second one is going to be your extrovert decider. Same thing. Savior demon does not matter. It's going to be, that's what it is. Cause that's what they're finding. And my, my theory is they haven't really explicitly said this, at least not to my knowledge from what I remember, 
but my theory is, is that because the sensory is grounded in the real world and the extrovert decider is what we're putting out to the real world, it's easier yeah. for them to actually see what someone's modalities are. So by doing the math, if let's just say you are more feminine with your FE and you're more masculine with your SI, you're going to, based on the math, have the opposite with your introverted function or your, um, your intuition and your introvert decider. So your introvert decider is going to be masculine TI and your extroverted intuition is going to be feminine. So that's, that's basically what they're saying. It's easier to look at mine mm -hmm. because mine, my, my, uh, modality is double masculine. And that's basically more saying that my SE, my TE, my sensory and my extrovert decider, that's, you can just follow along with that. And then you can infer or imply that my NI and my FI are going to be feminine. So if you look at the math over there, that's basically what it is. And the yeah. modalities are what they're finding is that people in their language have either when they, when they, um, when they learn their primary mode of learning can be through audio, which is what you do kinesthetic, which is what I do. So basically body movement, you know, like, you know, moving, moving the actual information, picking it up, feeling what the weight is just kind of like, you know, with the physical. And then the other one is visual, which is FM. Um, and that's more going to be, if you look at the SETE guy, that's an FM right there. So the extrovert uh, observer is um, the, the, sorry, the, the sensory is feminine and the uh, extrovert decider, the TE is masculine. So that person's a visual SETE. Now their primary mode of, of, of learning information is through visual learning. And um, with that too, um, in the language, and, and then there's also, also double feminine, which is more tester. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more careful with the information. Um, they're a little bit more lighter. So instead of like, you know, really pushing on it, you know, kinesthetically, like how I would, they would kind of be a little bit softer and talk a little bit softer about the information. Who knows? I mean, it, it, it's kind of like this, like they're not really shoving it at the audience. Like with me, what I'm doing is I'm shoving it at you guys. I'm shoving it at everybody. And I want you guys to really just take in this information, kinesthetically shove. And you're just like, whoa, holy, holy crap. That's a lot of energy you're putting out there. Yeah, it is because I'm doubling up on my SEMIT and it's double masculine. So in my language, um, or just like in how I present myself, I'm doing a lot of movements, I'm moving my body. I'm just like, I just can't stop. So my way yeah. of learning is through movement. I can't, I can't just sit still like this and teach and go like that. I have to move with the information. I have to really feel it and move it. You know what I mean? So you, you have to hear it. And that's kind of interesting because I feel like when you look up, I notice you look up a lot. You're taking in the information. You're probably also hearing it in your head so that you can ask another question. You know what I mean? <laughs> just like that. I'm not sure if I'm hearing it, but I don't know. I've always thought I was more of a someone who actually learned best through reading. Reading? Oh, it's like more of a visual. Yeah. yeah. At least when I was younger, I used to have a problem where actually when these people would talk to me, I used to have trouble mm -hmm. actually noticing what they were saying to me. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is with the modalities is that um, the modalities are a little, like it's, it doesn't really matter as much. Because yeah. really what you want to get down to is the core human needs and exactly what it is that their animal order is so that you can help them address, mm -hmm. you know, what it is that they're, they're having a hard time with. The, the, the modalities are a little bit more of like, a, it's there and it's present and, you know, you might want to tone it back. If let's say you're double masculine on your, on your savers and it's your sensory and extrovert desire, you might want to tone it back a little bit because you might be coming off as a little bit too intense. So I feel like it's more of like a better way to connect with people to know exactly where it is that you're pushing on them as opposed to something like, you know, it's, it's important to know the information because I have to know what my modalities are in order to actually understand myself. No, no, no. It's just more of like a kind mm -hmm. of like um, a reminder. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like maybe I should be toning it back a little bit. Maybe I'm kind of going, coming mm -hmm. on too strong. So right. in, just need to and, and, and well, so was this, was this idea of the visual, the auditory and the um, kinesthetic learning styles, was that something which was foundational towards understanding the, the modalities? You know, it, the way that Dave and Trenton had described it in the past was more of like they're finding what they're finding too is that people who with the modalities, so like they, they found that they found patterns. So basically, what Dave and Trenton are looking at when yeah. they're building the system is the patterns. They're trying yeah. to see what is it that what is it that they're looking at that um, is creating these patterns, and how does it fall into when they organize it on a Google Doc? How does it how does it show up in these people? And and because what they want to do is they want to like they want to draw out what are some commonalities? So if someone let's just say is like, 
an ENFP, a female ENFP and their, um, their masculine FI, you know, what is the pattern that they're getting from that? You know, are they getting that their people in that, in that category have bipolar disorder? Are they getting that people in that category are more, um, uh, like their sexual orientation is a little bit, um, uh, is, is, is like either gay or whatever for women, are they seeing the same thing in men? So it's, it's more of like a, a way to really just like understand the patterns of people and like what's coming out, um, from their, uh, from, from, from their, their, their information that they're, that they're gathering and organizing. Um, another thing too, that, I, that, um, is useful is it helps when typing to know if the person has, like they're, they're seeing a correlation or a pattern that people who usually have stronger memory yeah. are usually more of a masculine sensory person, people who have, mm. um, people who are, who have like, you know, their memory is a little bit like, you know, it's like, I don't know where I was on that day at that place. Like, whereas the masculine sensory is like, oh yeah, I was at Katie's party and I saw Sally there and Sally was talking to Katie and, and we were talking yeah. about this. And I remember that, that Joe spilled his drink and all this stuff. So it's like, they have more of like a kinesthetic, like, uh, let me see. It's, this, this is basically what happened. Oh yeah. That, that, that's where the information, it's more like a braille board. Whereas the visual has to actually see and remember and recall the information through a visual. And they're usually a lot more solid on their patterns in yeah. when they're like and basically like they're like this is what's gonna go this is what's gonna happen we're it's gonna happen like this i know it's gonna happen like this and they're more confident when it comes to their uh intuition because mm -hmm. the feminine sensory is kind of movable but they've they've kind of taken in the pattern of it a little bit um more unconsciously where it becomes more solid um versus the feminine sensory which is more movable so it's interesting you say that that um i know at least for myself in terms of memory I've got really bad memory for where I was in said place, how the conversation went, for instance, what was said, what was done. Very bad at that. I do have a good sort of fact memory in terms of taking in new stuff like these sorts of theories. I'll be able to explain it probably, probably almost as well as you can with all your experience after a few, you know, sitting down and watching, reading through it. So mm -hmm. piecing, piecing that together, because the description you described suggested sound a bit more to me like I may have been feminine sensing, but I know mm. that I'm masculine sensing because um, of my M, therefore my intuition is actually feminine. Um, mm. well, I know one person said that um, Jack just said he learns visually, thus making their typing him wrong, but that's sort of not the point. In objective personality, you don't really know yourself. It is up for Dave and Shannon, whoever else is reading the patterns to tell you about yourself based on the, what they've seen, which is objective. Whereas mm -hmm. what you know about yourself is subjective. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially like um, from what I'm gathering from that is like, it's it's more, it's, like I said, it's more in your language, like someone who's visual, it, this is all anecdotal, like this is not really something that they've, that they've solidified, but it's like, they've seen a pattern where people are like in visual language, like, oh, I can see what you're saying. I, you know, like you're not, or like, you're not understanding the picture I'm trying to paint you. I'm trying to, I'm just, I'm saying this right over here and, and you're seeing it like this. You're seeing the picture I'm trying to paint as this when I'm trying to have you see it as this. So it's more of like an unconscious thing that people do. And, um, you know, people like audio, like you're not hearing me. You're not, you're not hearing or listening to what I'm saying to you. Like, it's just more of like little instances that is pointing to that. And it's helping them almost like, um, almost narrowed down a little bit, a little bit further. doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Usually that's the part that uh, people get confused on because it may not actually be what it is. So you might actually be a visual uh, learner, but um, you know, based off of, you know, what you're, what you're conveying or how you're saying it or whatever, the words that you're using, they're kind of going based off of that more so than anything. Um, but it's, it's, it's harder to prove the modalities because they are something that's, that's, that, that, that's so, it's new and it's not exactly the most um, reliable. And it's probably one of the least important things when typing because the modalities, like I said, are just one small piece compared to all the other things that you should be prioritizing, which is what are your animals, what are your human needs, you know, and what, um, and what are you like, what is your life struggles? So I can understand how people might be confused about it. I'm kind of confused about it too. Um, but when I, when I look back on it and I look in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, I do actually learn a little bit more kinesthetic. Like I do have to kind of like, you know, do a little bit more of a shove or something like that. I feel like I'm more of an audio learner. Um, but mm -hmm. I guess the kinesthetic, like, you know, the kinesthetic is secondary to it. And that's another mm -hmm. thing too. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I didn't yeah. let's say pick up in the audio. And also uh, would I be a tester? 
No, you would actually be an audio kinesthetic learner. But the thing is that um, every, everyone has all modalities. It's just more of like, what are you like? What are you using the most, and what are you using the least? Mm, so, yeah. for me, um, I would be using kinesthetic audio. You'd be using audio kinesthetic, and then um, it's kind of like coins. So let's just say, like you see the play. Uh, there's a like the opposite of play is sleep. The opposite of consume is blast. It's like this, it's like there's coins there too. Excuse me. Where um, the opposite of audio is visual, and the opposite of kinesthetic is tester. So my order, technically, they don't go into depth about this, but they imply it. My order yeah. would be kinesthetic, audio, visual, tester last. Because my kinesthetic is the opposite tester, which is at the bottom, so the top and the bottom, kind of like the SE and the NI, right? S -E -N -I. Ah, they've worked out the same theory in the patterns for this. I see. Right. And what I'm doing right now is kinesthetic. I'm kind of using, I'm using my body to explain yeah. something. This is kinesthetic right here, what I'm doing. So um, I don't really know how to describe testers. So anyone has a question about that, I really am sorry. I don't know how to describe it. I feel like it's going to be a little, it's going to have like a hint of visual to it. And it's going to be like a little bit more flowy. You know what I mean? It's And, and um, it's going to be a little bit softer in how they describe it. It's not going to be like kinesthetic body movements. So if anyone has a question about tester, I can't explain it to you. Dave and John are also a little confused about it too. But it's more of like, you know, testing, tasting, kind of seeing how the information sits a little bit and not really kind of like letting it overtake them. Whereas the kinesthetic, you just want to like go all in on it. So um, but there, and there's that. So yours would be, yours would be audio, kinesthetic, yeah. tester, and visual. So visual's right at the bottom. Interesting. According to, according to your type. Now, like I said, the, the modalities are often right. something that they don't necessarily uh, type 100% correctly, they can, they can switch it up, but those don't really matter. Like I said, what matters is the other parts. The modalities are just kind of like um, kind of like a bonus or like a supplement to your type. Oh, no worries. It's still nice to have. And I noticed they've, they've leaned a lot of it in terms of looking at certain physiological similarities between people of the, the same types. Like the, fem, the double feminine ones look more feminine. Yes. And the masculine ones look more masculine, which is interesting. And I guess I'm sort of at a halfway in between, which is quite right. cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I think, Joseph, thank you so much for explaining to us about OP. I of think course. it will be good to do now is maybe go to questions from the audience. Absolutely. So, do you want to put, put us back onto like a big screen? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I'm going to stop sharing now. And let's okay. go. We go to this way of doing it. Yeah, that's better. Right. Let's see what questions we have here. Let's see, there's already one um, just further up. Hang on. Ooh. Here we go. One from Blue Yeti. Um, does objective mean consensus? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, so according to the theory, objective does not necessarily mean consensus. It means essentially you have a checklist, right? And this is like the most important part when typing. And I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't say this in the beginning. But it's good that this question was brought up. Um, it's, it's more of like you have a checklist and the checklist has definitions. And so the whole point of being objective is to have two separate, two people in separate rooms and use the checklist with an understanding of the definitions and the information that's on the checklist. Mm. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to observe a person on a video or, you know, doing like a, an interview where you're behind one of those, uh, plate glass mirrors, right. Um, where you're trying to basically take in the observations and follow the checklist and say, okay, this person sounds like they're having more decider issues or they're like, based on what they're saying, their stories that they're giving and their whole life problems are, are revolving around uh, decider issues. So I'm going to check off decider on my checklist. And so at the end of the checklist, when you're finished typing and you're, and, and you go with your partner, you take the two checklists and you compare them and you say, okay, do we get it right? We did. Okay. So we're seeing a pattern there that's making this potentially objective. So we're going to call this person this type and we're gonna put it in our docs and we're gonna see when we put this person in our docs, are they relating to the other people in their docs? Are they having the same issues? And if we're not, then what we'll do is we'll do a test retest and then we'll just go and try it again and, and see if mm -hmm. there's something else that we might've not picked up on. Maybe they were experiencing something at the time, but you know, usually the methods are objectivity is what's considered the um the overall 
uh, answer basically by having the two separate people sitting in separate rooms and go down the same checklist, get the same result. Okay. Very mm -hmm. good. So well, I could basically sum up there for objectivity as a mixture of one, putting aside your personal biases, just looking at the patterns and allowing the patterns to type rather than have, having your own personal bias about your own type. And also an emphasis on inter-rater reliability. But if two people are both seeing patterns independently, then that is objectivity. And the idea is that the more people have seen the patterns, the more objectivity there is. So there's an element of consensus in there, but consensus through independently reaching the same result and being reliable across that result. Right, I see. Okay, let's see what else there is. Um, Crimson is asking, how can two people make something truly objective? Hmm. Well, you know, like th th that's the thing that we're trying to figure out. That's the answer that we're all trying to, to understand is, is this actually truly objective? Based off of the data, based off of what we're like, you know, what, what Dave and Shannon are come, are bringing into their, into, into their, um, their docs, by the way, I am not working for Dave and Shannon. I am not affiliated with them in any way. This is just basically what, I'm learning from them myself. I just want to put that out there. So I'm not like on, I'm not on their sidelines as being their spokesperson. This is just me trying to help out you guys and Jack, because I really do think that the community, like that the objective personality community is just so much fun. And I really kind of connect the socionics and objective personality community. But the thing about making uh, two people making something truly objective, the thing is, is that you're, when you're going into it, you're, you're making your own guess. You're being subject, you're making a subjective guess. And objectivity is almost like, you know, uh, um, a negative plus a negative equals a negative, a positive plus a positive equals a positive, right? It's not going to be like, you know, it's, if it's a positive and a negative equals a negative, then something happened and that, like, you know, and, and you have to go back to the drawing board and you have to figure out how can we make our subjective guesses, like, you know, how can we make it objective, essentially? Um, but, you know, that's that's the question. That's the question. Is it is it objective? I don't know. I don't know if mm. we if we do know. But the whole goal is, getting people to understand the, the theory and the information so that when let's say Dave and Shannon say, okay, now you guys are going to do it and you're going to see if you come up to the same type. Now you're going to um, have them do it. And based off of the same, the more people that are doing it and typing, the more objective it'll be because everyone's coming to the same result and you're following the same method of sitting in two separate rooms um, and following the same checklist with the same understanding of the definitions. And I think that's interesting that the, the realm of what is objective and what is subjective making it up has been a source of debate in the past. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it isn't about the objectivity of an individual. At the end of the day, they're looking at patterns, things that just happen to they almost like hunches, which they which they feel and they in terms of each coin. The coins are objectively written out, but they're getting mm -hmm. sort of hunches about each coin. I think he's more this, I think she's more that. And then right. The objectivity comes in when those hunches happen to align with another person in another room who hasn't been looking at what you're doing, who comes up with exactly the same sorts of hunches. Right. So there is sort of subjectivity into the objectivity. And I think right. that Dave and Shan, they think that we're all subjective. So it's a question of how objective can we make ourselves integrated reliability for them is the marker. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So next we have one from. Crimson King, mm -hmm. have you encountered any people you felt were strongly mistyped within OP? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I I think that I have my own personal theory on that and my own personal you know idea of what I think. Um, in my opinion, like I said, I'm not affiliated with Dave Shannon. This is just my opinion. I think that the more someone is aware and conscious of um the the like them uh, of the fact that they're being typed the the more likely that someone might be to depending on how vulnerable they feel kind of not really give what they what they what they would give if they didn't know you know what i mean so it's like that's just my theory um but as far as you know as far as like the data they're getting 90% and above and they're typing people independently in the same way. Um, and so the data is basically the, um, is, is what they're, what they're going off. It's a very TE like process. It's very, right. it's very TE in, 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 in essence, but um, you know, like I, there definitely have to be mistyped. Nothing is a hundred percent, you know, like in, in statistics, like there, there has to be, but 
nine out of 10 times, you know, like 90% of the time they get the types correct. So their, their reasoning is because out of the nine out of 10 people that we get correct, we might get one person off, you know, completely somewhere, but because we're getting nine out of 10, that's still enough to keep us going so that we continue using the methods that we're using. If it starts derailing somehow in some way, it might be harder to, uh, it might, there, then there might be, need to be some changes to it. But, you know, of course, I think that there, there might be mistypes. Absolutely. There's nothing, like I said, nothing's 100%. That would be asinine and absurd. And, and did you, did you say, is that nine out of 10 of their, their agreement? So between Dave and Shannon, they nine out of 10 times, they reach accordance in terms of integrated reliability. Is that the nine out of 10? Yeah, more like nine people out of 10 people that they type, they might get one person wrong. Right, okay. Kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so it's, so it's not a question of nine out of 10 times. They then ask the person, does it sound like you? And they say, yeah, this sounds a lot like me. It's not, they're no, not no, doing no. that. No, it no, makes no, sense. No, no, no. Right, I see. So nine out of 10 times, Dave and Shannon agree on, on, on your type if you were to go for typing. But what right. isn't factored in is whether or not you agree with that typing or not. That's not, because at the end of the day, that is for them subjective and they're dealing with objectivity, which is for them is them both reaching integrated reliability on patterns, which they've seen from your objective videos. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. I think we've got a few more. Um, hmm. I right, saw a bit further down. Ah, one from Blue Yeti. Mm -hmm. How are testers picked and are the lenses biases of their types taken into account in the cons? Oh, no, the testers are, testers are, the tester is a kind of um, thing in modality, right? It's how you're learning, a, a testing way of learning. What you mean is, an, I think what you mean is an operator, how operators pick. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, I think that, so they have it on their website on how they pick their operators. It's, um, there, there is like a method they use um, where they, they try to, they, they do bi this thing called bias training. And um, it's essentially like, you know, you, if you have your type, what they, what they do is they, they um, try to get you to face your demons and, and understand that, you know, and, and get out of your, get out of like your world in which that you live, where like you're not, uh, where, where you're in fixed mindset and get you out of fixed mindset into growth mindset and growing happens in your demons. Yeah. And it ha also happens when you power down your saviors. So their ideal candidate, I would say, based off of what I read on their website and based off of what I have heard them say in the classes is, um, you know, you, you have to be aware that you're not see, you're only seeing part of reality you're not seeing all of reality and you have to address your demons in the sense of growing them and giving them giving them life essentially and taking back the addiction on your saviors and it's going to take a lot of effort it's going to take a lot of work it's going to be painful so growing through the pain and getting your helping to uh, allow yourself to get out on the other side and basically go from you know dancing in the light go into the cave get immersed in complete darkness and then go out the other side into paradise, essentially, is how I see it. So it's like, it's, it's, I, I was actually explaining this analogy to someone today where, um, think of it like this fixed mindset. You're on a, you're on a, on an island, right? And the island's nice. There's a tribe there. You're having fun. It's always sunny. And there's a cave on the outskirts. So what growth is, is going into that cave and going deep into the cave. And the thing is that some people, what they'll do, is they'll go into the cave just far enough, but not where they're immersed in complete darkness. And and you know, there's some light is some light is coming in. They can see just enough, so it's like they're almost going in, but they're not exactly going in. And then they get too scared and they jump out. What growth is is going into that cave, deep into that cave. And there's this there's this thing where anyone who goes into the cave will never come out, right? The thing is that they do come out on the other side. And the whole thing about coming out on the other side is that you don't want to go back once you reach paradise. You want to continue staying and living there because you know that going back is where you were, um, where you were fixed mindset, and you want to be growth mindset. So they, their ideal candidate to pick to eliminate bias and all that is someone who goes into the darkness of the cave and comes out with this almost enlightenment of 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 what their life 
was and what it now is in, in terms of growing themselves. Okay. Thank you for that, Joseph. Thank you for the question, Bouyetti. Space in is more of a statement, which I think I could also answer. But you can't wrap your head around how some can be two different types cross those joints and no P. Well, I'd see there are some majorly different definitions for different things in OP. In socionics, I'd say that, you know, we are looking at people's motivations, we're looking at people's values, and that's more of a conversational thing. We need to get the sense of who they are as a person. Whereas I think OP, it's more about seeing these patterns which they've predefined. They got these these coins. Um, they reach these patterns, these these coins through um, their own assessment of different patterns over a few years. And also, what you can find is that you may meet certain parameters of each of these coins, but then your behaviors and your motivations, how you perceive them, may be very, very different. And they can explain it with animals. So other theories within theories are parts making it up. So lots of different extra parts until you actually reach this 512. So right. a, a typing in OP can be completely, well, it can be tied up in such a way where it may look like something completely different. So it leads to a very sort of different typing of sociology, you're just talking to you, getting to know you as a person, looking at what information elements you're using. And even then, there are definitions which are different. For instance, you talked about, Joe, about ob 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 um, ob extroverted observers and how yeah. it's more about what sorts of new information, never on novelty. That would be far more right. about extrovert intuition than extrovert sensation and socionics. And that could explain why so many of the extroverted observers I've typed, even people say who are SEFI, as an example, mm -hmm. I've ended up typing as extrovert intuition ego types. I've typed mm -hmm. um, ESF, what would be like an ESFP in OP, as an EII. I've met two people who've been typed ESFPs, I've typed as EIIs, because it's the extrovert intuition which is coming out there. And mm -hmm. that's because SEFI, sense of self coming out, which can also link more to the introverted ethics and so sort of that sort of more self-sufficiency of delta values. There's so many different ways you can draw lines between one part and OP and another part and socionics to reach a different sort of typing. It is mm -hmm. a very complex interaction. These two, I'd say, very complex theories. Mm -hmm. Some people say socionics are more complex. I say no, I think they're both very complex, but arranged in different ways and laid out in different ways. I say OP more laid out like a line of different things to go through, whereas sociologics is more of a, a layered part going up or down and then interplays between. Right, and something else too to, that I wanna build off of with that is um, sociologics incorporates all eight functions and uh, objective personality incorporates just the four that are, I guess, the valued functions in uh, sociologics. So, um, you and I have talked about this too many times in terms of like our theories, in terms of how objective personality and, and socionics are connected and whatnot. So there, there seems to be, there's patterns that are there. Um, I'm noticing them a lot, especially in the people from objective personality that are getting typed in by you and socionics. So it's, it's, they're there, but what my goal, my mission is, what my long-term is, is trying to figure out how are the two systems connected and how can we almost um, enhance both of them, and not not you know enhance op with socionics, um, not just like that. Or I'm saying more like how can we also enhance socionics with objective personality? So I my my whole entire reason for doing this, for for working with you and for talking to people in the world socionics society and, and whatnot, and also the objective personality community, is because I think that there is something there. I think that there is something that that we should be exploring. And I really, what I want to do is I want to just bring the communities together so that we can look at this together and, and, you know, just make some, some more, um, some, some more refined leaps and almost kind of like figure out because the scientific method that they're using with the checklist is working beautifully. They're, they're getting types correct. Right. So but the thing is that their types and your types, there's some sort of correlation in terms of, um, in terms of like, you know, what you and I are noticing in terms of patterns. So I think that that's something that's worth looking at. And that's why I really, really want to, you know, because at the end of the day, what I want to do, you know, as you, as you know, as an EI, EIE, I should say, is I want to, I just want, I want to give back to people. I want people to, to grow. I want to heal this world. I want to mm -hmm. make something big happen for the people of this world, because we're all like, you know, people are suffering every day, but how much would they actually suffer if they realized that it's not their fault that they're suffering. Mm. I mean, their choices, I guess, are their fault, but it could be better explained if they, there was some sort of 
um, some sort of, you know, uh, method to kind of help them understand you're doing it not because you're broken, not because there's something wrong with you, but because this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. I think it's very much about understanding those, that mission of actually connecting us together. I think it's a very mm -hmm. important thing. I think yeah. just finding that underlying aspect of personality, working on our differences, finding the consistencies, find where the inconsistencies are, how you can work through them. Eventually, I see us becoming one sort of typology, but mm -hmm. that involves many conversations to be had, much again to know each theory in depth and seeing what does things right, what does things wrong, what are the best methods? Are some methods mm -hmm. working better than others? Which ones are, at the end of the day, um, having more meaning and relevance to people? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd like to look at more over time. Right. Um, I'm going to take two more questions, and I think we can wrap sure. up. So okay. here's one from Lau. Lau says, how do they know the agreement of the tester is because they are independently seeing the same reality rather than having all been taught to think the same? Hmm. How do they know the agreement of the tester? So I guess the operator they're saying is because Operate. yeah, they are Not independently seeing. <laughs> For me, it's something completely different. So yeah. in my mind, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, wait, wait. but uh, okay. So the operator is because they are independently seeing the same reality um, rather than having all been taught to think the same. Uh, so I'm a dumbass. Can you please help me with that question? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I think this is like the, um, Okay, so there have been a number of uh, theories out there, a bit like Podler, for instance, where you yeah. had a phenomenon where, wow, we're independently seeing the same patterns, and they're doing some very strange typings, if I recall in Podler, right? But that is because they're all seeing something. They thought that that, is, that means it must be something real and relevant. Well, right. something real, I think that makes sense. They're all seeing it. But whether it's relevant and useful to a particular sort of uh, personality, they could be... I. If, they, if people are consistently identify the same patterns, they have an iterative reliability, it doesn't necessarily mean there's something valid about what they're seeing. It just means that they're reliably seeing that, that stuff. They, 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 they right. pick up the same smoke, as it were. Right. And they, they're very good at identifying uh, the white smoke from the red smoke, even though it's all smoke at the end of the day and doesn't actually tell you much about the actual personality, um, which could also lead into problems, say, if they're also ignoring, say, the, how people then react to what they're being given typed. So this is what I think is what Lau's getting at. So how do you know that the agreement of a tester, that these operators are reaching their decisions because they're both looking at something which is real about personality, rather than being taught over time through alignment, getting to know each other's patterns and aligning their hunches to see the same sorts of things? Are they, in, oh, okay. are they truly independently reaching the same stuff or over time are they just converging and reaching congruence over getting to know each other so well and being used to seeing the same smoke? Right. That's actually a really good question. Mm. Um, hmm. Well, <laughs> you know what I think. Um, mm. I, I I think that there is a little bit of convergence there, um, but I also do think that there is something in terms of the patterns that are being seen. So I think it's right. a little bit of both. I don't think that it's like more one or the other. Um, but that's why I think that system, that any system, any new system needs refinement constantly over time. It needs updating. It needs to be um, looked at constantly. And and you can't just, you know, fly this to your pants and think that this is like the system is, is you know, foolproof because eventually systems do break down. A car will break down eventually and you have yeah. to, you know, get new parts. You can't just keep on riding on the same parts. You need to update. And that's a scary thing too, because it's like, you know, the system is working and it's working really, really well, but, you know, what if there is something that we're missing that we're not incorporating that we have to, take into consideration. And so that's why I really, that's why I've taken a, um, I've, I've taken a, um, uh, a wanting to learn socionics and get into that too, because I think that they are seeing something, they are seeing patterns. And to be honest with you, I just learned socionics not too long ago. And my understanding of it is it, it, it's, 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 it's being, it's like so quick. And you know this too. I've talked with you. We had prior conversations. Yeah. My understanding, because I've learned objective personality, is is happening a lot faster than someone who's never been exposed to socionics or objective personality before, yeah. and only MBTI, in my opinion. Because it, it, what I'm seeing is that the patterns are lining up, and 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 you know there could be convergence, but it can also it, it's a mix. So good question, but 
not really sure that I can give you a, a full, complete, honest answer with that. Okay. And last question. We got a toughie from Kim Jansen. Of course, Kim's uh -oh. going to give a tough question. Oh, Here come on, go. Kim. <laughs> I didn't even know you were watching. Between OPS and socionics, which seems more reliable to you and why? And do you think? Uh, Kim, <laughs> you want me to share with you my honest opinion? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because the thing is, is that, you know, oh. oh, my gosh, this is so controversial. Oh, Kim, I know you're laughing right now. You're like, yup, yup. Okay. Gosh. Kim is an ESTJ, by the way, both in socionics and in objective personality, just so you guys know that. So she she would, you know, just do this to me. Um, I don't think that any one system, and I'm going to give you a very political answer. I don't think any one system is reliable. I think the patterns are consistent. And for me, I'm... I'm loving learning socionics because I think that it's a very interesting way to connect objective personality. Um, but in my opinion, I think that both of them have their merits and I think that both of them are, are, are seeing the same patterns. So I would say in terms of reliability, in ter or is she saying in terms of what I feel aligns with me? more it, it, it could be interpreted in multiple ways now what i'd say is this i'd actually say that if you interpret if you look at reliability as interrate reliability i'd probably mm -hmm. say op is more reliable i would say op yes. in that you, you've got two people who over time um, over time have managed to reach 90 percent interrate reliability for themselves in the yep. same path i wouldn't say that socionics has a great interrate reliability to boast of except that i'd say now when i'm like you know, doing public interviews, people mm -hmm. are very quickly coming to the same sort of the typings which I'm coming to. That's still right. not as good because they're not behind the veil, which is what they're very mm -hmm. good at doing. They're going to go in two separate rooms. It's hard to recreate online. Right. So in that sense, yes. But if you talk about reliability in sense of when I use this time and time again, it's giving me accurate, detailed views into people and how they tick. And again, it allows you to get to know people and relate to people better. Right. Personally, I, I I still think socionics takes that kind of reliability, um, mm -hmm. but it's up to you really to decide that. It's based on your own experiences and getting to know right. the two fit. Because the thing is that a lot of people do find objective personality personality be very valuable, and think that socionics is you know a load of you know malarkey. But I think that something that socionics does that's great is it's looking at all eight functions, which I think is actually a very um, interesting take on personality typology. Um, and objective personality, what it's doing is it's actually doing that inter interrelated reliability where you're pretty much following a checklist in a more scientific method kind of way um, in terms of, um, you know, seeing the patterns um, where you're you're separate from somebody, but you're also you're seeing like the same thing that they're seeing kind of thing and being able to be being able to teach that in such a way that it just it's, it, it feels a lot more. Um, it feels a lot more uh, certain. There's a lot more certainty for a lot of people because a lot of people do really love the objective personality method because it's like, you know, they do relate to it. I mean, Kim, you're a prime example of that. Like you were typed as an LSE in socionics and you were also typed as a double masculine TESI, blast play, consume sleep, ESTJ in objective personality. So someone like you, there. so there is, like I said, there is a connection there. There is patterns. Do I think that people can, yeah, right? So it's like, there could be mistypes there and people like, you know, one might be, someone might actually feel like this one is more them than the other, but it's ultimately up to the person and how they're gonna take their map and guide themselves through the world. So for me, I found that um, objective personality has helped me so much because it actually allowed me to get into my darkness. But I feel like there's something about socionics that that really just, I don't know, it, it, just, it just explains a lot for me. So that's why I really want to look at the two systems and see, okay, where is there the disconnect, but we're also where are the connections. So that's why I'm 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 not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that you know in general there just seems to be um, they're both really good in their own ways because there are the patterns that are there that socionics shows and also objective personality shows, and there's a lot of overlap. I think that's a very I think that's a very uh, nuanced and diplomatic answer, Joe. So that's good. Um, <laughs> 
Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on here, give us explanations and answering some of these questions, some tougher than others, of course. Of course. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. You as well. Yeah. And everyone that's watching, please enjoy yourselves. And if you have any questions, you can always find me in the Objective Personality groups on Facebook, or you can find me in the Discord groups as well. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can always ask Jack and he can I can help you guys out with that, okay? That's all good. Thank you very all much. Right. And thank you everyone for very tuning well. in. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.